Moran is the edible bean and canola specialist. I changed the wording on her uh, title. Uh, Ontario uh, for the uh, Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Uh, in her current role, uh, Megan creates extension materials to support on-farm decision making and conducts research and demonstrates projects to generate uh, towards improved crop management. Recent projects in dry beans include variable rate seeding of cranberry and white beans, investigating and surveying new pathogens and developing a website for dry bean agronomy. Uh, Megan, it's all yours. Thanks so much, Dennis. Um, I guess I'll start by saying, uh, since I mentioned the website there, I don't have any slides on this, but I am working on a website, site drybeanagronomy.ca, and Chris has provided me with at least a dozen summaries of his research, and that will go up, and we hope to launch it in February, so uh, stay tuned for that. But yeah, so I guess it's kind of strange that canola and edible beans are combined together in, in one role. I'm not the oilseed specialist. We have three million acres of soybeans, give or take, and my colleague Horst Bonner uh, takes care of the soybeans. You're probably familiar with him. Um, so I am going to talk about both dry beans and canola in Ontario and I really thank you guys for inviting me to talk. I'm just going to give kind of an overview of what's new in those crops and, and some of the challenges that we face growing them in Ontario. Start with dry beans. So um, here is our yield and, and acreage over the last two years. This is all crop insurance data but most of our acres are insured. Um, and as you can see, we, we grow, about half of what we grow is white beans. Um, we have more varieties of white beans. And so we're able to push production a little bit further north than some of the, some of the other types. And um, we see sort of corn and soybean growers kind of come in and out of growing white and black beans as they're attracted to the price point or, or they have some acres they wanna put some beans on. And uh, I guess, as you can see here, we have much higher acreage in 2020 than we did uh, last year. And actually 50% more acres of dry beans in 2020 than we did in 2018. And um, you know that may be because beans were flying off the grocery store shelves in the spring, but also we had a tough cold spring this year. And so uh, some acres of corn and soybean, excuse me, corn and soybeans were switched to, to dry beans. Um, you can see we're growing kidneys and crayons. So dark red kidneys, whites and light reds. Um, and adzukis, acreage of adzukis really increasing. I'll talk about adzukis a little bit more in, in the next couple slides, but they're the highest price point bean. And so uh, they're attracting a lot of growers and we're seeing more and more acres. Of course, uh, you can also see that yields aren't very strong. And you know some growers are having a lot of success and others aren't, or it's a field by field scenario. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about more about that. Um, that Japan other category is kind of a catch-all category for other market classes, uh, primarily Otibo beans, which are shipped to Japan, uh, some small reds and other things in there too. Um, and so, it, as you can see, we've enjoyed quite strong yields over the last few years. Uh, 2019 was, was fairly dry, but of course, dry beans don't mind that too much. And uh, this year was, was also, we had kind of a cold or, or tough spring, um, but uh, we, we did have good yields this year. Some, some areas were too dry and there were some losses this year, but really nice open harvest window uh, this year and, and lots of good quality beans. Of course, our yield data uh, for this year is preliminary. I think the due date to report is this week, so uh, that's not totally up to date. Those numbers will change. Okay, so in terms of what's new, I've talked about increasing acreage and some of these other market classes we're seeing more and more of. So Otibos are one of those. They're, I'm not sure if you grow them in Manitoba, they're kind of like a white bean, but larger. We only have one or two varieties and uh, they, they tend to lodge and there are some challenges with Otibos, but we're seeing higher demand for Otibos. Um, and I think you grow small reds in Manitoba. We don't grow as many, but, but seeing more interest from, from the buyers looking for more acres of small reds. Um, and so a lot of these other market classes, again, higher price points, and they're attracting some of those experienced growers to give it a try and, and try and uh, rake in some extra money on these uh, high demand or, or different uh, market classes. Lima beans are another one that I think we should watch out for. I actually don't know much about lima beans, but I keep coming across fields in, in a certain part of Ontario. So uh, we're seeing a bit of lima production and I'm curious to see where that goes. 
Okay, and so Itzukis, I thought I'd talk about them a little bit more. I'm not sure how familiar you are with them. They're the one type that are not uh, common beans, they're not Phaseolus vulgaris, they're a different beast altogether. So um, they, they are unique. And you know, one of the unique things is they don't push that seed, uh, seed leaves up through the soil surface. So that's kind of different. Um, they have a very hard seed coat. And I've heard this phrase a million times, once an Itzuki bean grower, always an Itzuki bean grower, guys love to say that. Um, and that's because that hard seed coat means that they uh, remain viable in the soil a long time and you get a lot of volunteer adzuki. So we've had to invest in research on how to control adzukis in other crops. And because they're a different species, um, the bean growers uh, group have invested a lot in you know, what um, herbicides are safe on adzuki and, and we have to try to promote that information because it's not the same as those other common bean types. Uh, sorry, backing up that hard seed coat is, it can be an advantage though, because if it rains when, when the beans are ready to harvest, they don't take on moisture. And so uh, you can get back out in the field as, as soon as you can and, and get them off. I've seen some really weird things in Itzukis, like, uh, well, for starters, they, they tend to stay green and, and branch out and, and regrow at the end of the season. So a lot of growers face challenges with green plants at harvest and um, green immature pods. I've also seen fields or areas of fields where there's tons of flowers on the plant, but no pods. So uh, we need more agronomic research. We really need to, I'd like to focus on narrowing in on better recommendations for growers. And uh, we are seeing a little bit, uh, uh, some breeding efforts. So hopefully we can get more than just the one variety in the future. Okay, so in terms of some things that are new in Ontario bean production, um, a move to reduce tillage is one of one of the things that's new. So in beans are the one crop that field crop that we grow that we feel kind of needs some tillage compared to the others. And, and we'd really like to move that move that forward and try to focus more on soil health. So we are seeing, um, you know, the kidneys, we're, we're still doing a lot of tillage because they're pulled and, and crans, although I have seen uh, growers pull crans on a strip tilled field. So so some of the things, you know, a little bit of no-till, not a lot, but uh, leaving corn stalks on the field over the winter and then just disking them in the spring, as you can see in the bottom photo. Um, and, and again, strip till is becoming really common. I know quite a few dry bean growers using strip till and some are even um, uh, harvesting a forage in the spring for livestock and then running the strip tiller and, and planting into that. And I think it's a really nice compromise of uh, strip till in general, just leaving residue on the soil surface and, um, you know, maintaining some of that soil structure, but having a good seed bed for those dry beans and, and they're not struggling to emerge. And we have some extreme stuff, um, some plant greens. So we have a big focus on, on cover crops and growers are really looking for ways to, to introduce cover crops into their rotation. You know, it's primarily uh, red clover in after, um, winter wheat, but we're looking for more opportunities. And I've seen, uh, like you see in the bottom left-hand photo, people planting right into a thick cover crop and then terminating the cover crop after planting. And I'm not suggesting everyone's doing this, but we real have, really do have some growers trying to push that envelope and really focus on, on soil health. Another thing we're seeing a lot of action on is variable rate input. So I've been involved in a three-year study on uh, variable rate seeding. Uh, in the project, we used um, premier cropping systems enhanced learning blocks. So that's that bottom left photo. Uh, we put 60 plots of four different seeding rates out in three fields of white beans every year and three fields of cranberry beans. And you can see in the photo, our, our low seeding rate is about 45,000 seeds per acre in white beans. And it's really obvious in the, in the spring and it makes me nervous that I asked a grower to do that. But actually we're not seeing uh, major yield losses there. So uh, looking forward to reporting on that project this winter and, and looking at some lower seeding rates or variable rating our seeds. So dialing back uh, seeding rates in um, highly productive areas of the field. And that kind of helps us pinch some pennies and, uh, and maybe manage white mold a little bit. Although I don't see um, a lot of evidence that that's a big part of white mold management, but anyway. Uh, variable rate fertility also. So it's more so to address um, uh, variability in soil fertility levels across the field. So areas that have historically been high yielding really drawn down the soil nutrient levels in those areas and we're trying to uh, use VR fertility to address those differences. 
not so much for the crop that we're growing, but to address the, the field as a whole. And then another thing that's really cool and, and it's really industry led and growers are just going for it is some variable rate fung fungicides. So the second pass of fungicide, um, we are often doing two pass fungicide for white mold control. And on that second pass, growers are taking aerial imagery of the field and um, have a prescription where the fungicide is turned off in the very thin areas of the field. So headlands or washed out areas, for example. And, you know, it's not necessarily super ground truth or, or researched, but I think it's a practical way to mitigate some economic risk and not uh, save some money on applying fungicide in those thin areas of the field where you really don't think it needs a second pass. Another thing that's new is um, yield monitors are, we have a couple of yield monitors out there on large seeded bean combines, which is a totally new thing. Although I think uh, you have some growers in Manitoba doing this as well. So uh, particularly on our seeding rate project, we have these two growers with these twin master picket combines and they installed this aftermarket yield monitor made by Greentronics. So it's uh, attached to the hydraulic motor that drives the elevator leg and, um, it measures a strain on that component, which has a linear relationship with the yield. And so then we can see that yield map in the cab as we go and um, on, on a Trimble or a John Deere display. And you can also wirelessly upload your data to the John Deere Operations Center. And I think this is an awesome opportunity to get a better idea of the variability in our large seeded bean fields and maybe start to try some different management practices and really see how those things perform maybe in strip trials or, or things like that. So I think uh, we're, this is really cool and I hope more growers get on board with this. Um, and so I like to think these, uh, the, in this project, we've produced the first yield maps of crayons in, uh, in Ontario. And I really, I think they are the first, uh, first yield maps. Um, and so talking to the brewers that are using them, um, you know, we have some things to work out. So if you look at the bottom yield map, that's one of the first maps we produced. And you see these red lines at the headlands where the combine's driving along and reporting zero yield. And that's because it takes time for the beans to come into the header and up into the elevator leg. And of course that delay happens in a soybean combine, for example, too, but it's just a known time delay and they've adjusted for it in the data. And so we're working towards that and some of our more recent maps look a lot better. Um, of course, one drawback is those yield monitors don't report on moisture, and so there's it's just uh, measuring weight. So there's that's not really an aspect, uh, and not a thing that it does. But um, and the growers that have been using it, you know, one one guy has it on two machines, and it works really well on one and not on the other. He's having some calibration issues, and you know, it's the the uh, monitors on um on a hydraulic motor. So the oil has to be at a certain temperature for it to work. So he said, I'm sitting there at the edge of the field waiting to harvest and I ah, forget it, I'm not gonna calibrate. Well, you know, it's possible to calibrate. Sometimes we're just too busy to do those things. And I think we're really getting towards some, some uh, good yield maps on crayons. Okay, so in terms of uh, challenges, of course, I have to mention weed control. We just have so few herbicide options in dry beans and, and we have you know, challenges with controlling uh, hard to control weeds and herbicide resistant weeds. We have a fair bit of group two resistance in parts of Ontario. And so the Ontario bean growers are investing a lot in uh, every year in weed control studies and screening uh, existing products for safety on dry beans and trying to get uh, dry beans added to some labels. And then as we move into reduced till, we, we come, uh, we uh, have more problems, I guess, with, you know, a lot of the products we use on the label, it says we have to incorporate them into the soil. And of course you can't do that in no-till or even strip-till because often the strip-tiller runs in the fall. So then we're just putting that herbicide on the soil surface and, and we run into some crop safety issues. So we have some things to work out there. And uh, of course, I'm sure you're familiar with the challenges with pre-harvest herbicides. So uh, we're no longer using glyphosate, uh, although we are on azuki beans, we haven't pulled the plug on that yet, but. Uh, for the most part, we're just using uh, saflufenicil, which I believe you call it heat, we call it aragon. Um, and, and it's not as good on some weeds and, and at, as fast at drying down as some other products. And so we need even sharper in-season weed control and, and especially on grasses. Um, and so we're trying to work with growers on, you know, best management practices around 
uh, pre-harvest use of saflufenacil, spray when it's sunny, make sure you have high water volumes and don't try to harvest like two days after you spray it. You, you sometimes have to wait 10 days. So, and now we're gonna, uh, I think invest, Ontario bean growers are gonna invest in some projects on what if we put interlock in the tank or AMS, does that help with dry down? So um, another high priority topic is Western mean cutworm. And I'm not sure if you have it in Manitoba, but this is a North American pest, flies into the province every year. Although we have some that overwinter, overwinter here, but uh, the bulk fly in uh, and they lay their eggs in dry bean and corn fields and the larvae feed on pods and, and corn silks and corn ears. And we do have quite an extensive trapping network. Uh, so we're monitoring the activity of this pest, but we don't have good thresholds and thresholds we've used in other jurisdictions don't seem to work well for us. Um, and so we're actually seeing a, a lot of fairly widespread insecticide use to manage this pest, but really need some research to narrow in on, you know, when do I, or when do I pull the trigger or when do I really have to spray because of yield and quality issues versus, you know, when, when should I not or not really need to. And I've spent countless hours scouting for this pest and almost never find it. Um, so scouting isn't really an option in the dry bean crop like it can be in corn. Certainly we can find pod damage and, you know, we know if we put a hole in a cranberry bean pod, that's a, the, the beans turn color and it's a real quality issue, but I'd really like to see more research on this pest and we could do a better job of, of managing, um, managing our costs and our, and our uh, insecticide inputs. Okay, so last slide on, on dry beans. Uh, this is just an issue that I've been seeing. Um, it's not a lot of acres, but more and more acres every year, it seems, and kind of spreading out from the region where we first found it. So um, what happens is uh, uh, a grower goes to, has a great looking field of beans and they go to apply their pre-harvest herbicide and, and some of the field dries down normally, but other areas of the field remain green, like you see in the photo there. And, when you go and look at those plants, they don't have any good beans on them. They're all aborted or deformed. And even if they kind of look not so deformed on the outside, they're all broken up on the inside. So they come up light on the scale. And so I, I truly don't know what this is. The beans look good all year. We don't think it's a nutrient issue. We've tested for diseases. It doesn't look like disease in terms of the, the, the plant foliage and the outside of the pods and that. Um, and it could be a virus or a phytoplasma, but I keep testing for that and not coming up with anything. So, um, you know, I call it green patch syndrome. Some growers call it crazy beans, which I kind of like. Um, uh, but, you know, if you have any idea what this might be, I have no answers for growers. So I'd be interested in having more discussions uh, with researchers. I've, I've done my best and I'll keep plugging away at it. Okay, so moving on to canola, um, I, I kind of love being a part of the canola industry in Ontario because it gets me traveling all over our beautiful province and uh, this photo is from up near Timmins, so a good, geez, I don't know, is it 10 or 12 hours from home for me, but they grow some beautiful canola up there. And so this is where we are growing spring canola in Ontario. It's kind of scattered around the province, but our key growing region is, is near the Quebec border in northern Ontario uh, in Temiskaming District. Uh, we have a bit in eastern Ontario and around Lake Huron is where we're still growing some canola, um, but we're, we're struggling with um, hot conditions a lot of years, hot dry conditions, and especially in eastern Ontario, they have hot seasons, but short seasons and, and heavy soils, so we're, we're not having a lot of success in the recent years. One area to watch for, though, is like Thunder Bay and, and even further west in the Rainy River District closer to Manitoba. Seeing more acres of canola there, and it's really nice high-yielding crop, and, and they don't have some of the insect issues um, that we see in other areas. And so I started this role five years ago, and um, um, we have, we've had low acreage that whole time. Um, and, you know, prices are a part of that. And some of the weather conditions are a part of that too, but we used to have a, a lot higher acreage and, um, you know, yields have historically been quite strong in Ontario, but we've seen some declines in recent years. And, and the real reason is, is Swede mint. Um, this is a key problem for our growers. So this pest emerges from the soil at the, around the 1st of June, lays its eggs on the growing points of the canola plant and those larvae feed on the, on the tissue and their salivary enzymes break down plant tissue. And, um, and we, we've done a lot of research, we've invested in, in a lot of work on, 
on thresholds. And our threshold is if you catch, you know, you put the sticky traps out um, uh, right as the canola is emerging. And when you catch 20 adults, uh, that's a threshold to imply, apply insecticides. And then if you catch five more adults within the next week or, or next few weeks, that's a second threshold to apply again. But the reality is, if you look at that sticky trap, that's you know much high, higher numbers than those thresholds are, are what we're commonly seeing. And I see lots of sticky traps that have three, four, and five times that amount of Swede midge. So it's incredibly overwhelming and our um, insecticide applications are far from 100% effective. And so what we see is um, if the Swede midge get in there before the crop bolts or elongates, um, you get what we have on the left, it won't bolt at all. That tissue's all been destroyed. And so that's essentially 100% yield loss. Um, more, more acres or more of the, you get that um, lack of bolting around the edges of the field and then in the kind of center of the field, the Swede midge um, just kind of just uh, damage the branching. The plant won't branch and then you get pods really low on the plant. So it's some yield loss and difficult to harvest um, with, with those low pods. And they can reproduce on flowers as well, but that's not like a major yield loss concern. Um, but so yeah, we're really struggling to, to manage this pest. And one of our key recommendations is to plant early, but um, you know, I'm wondering if we really need to do something different here because the earlier you plant, the colder the soils are. You know, we want to plant early so that we can get it bolted before June 1st, but cold soils and flea beetle pressure and, and low phosphorus levels, and especially on clay soils, the plant's actually not growing faster, it's growing slower. So uh, we need to find ways around a Swede midge and manage our crop differently to get around the problem. Um, but we also have club root. So um, particularly in that key growing area at the Quebec border, uh, we have, we've seen um, uh, significant club root damage and we have those newer or more virulent uh, pathotypes that are a real challenge to manage. So um, I did a bit of a soil survey and the red dots are where we've seen actual uh, symptoms. The yellow dots are where we've seen um, that we just have a positive soil test for club root. And so some areas don't have club root yet where the blue dots are, but I obviously like it's, it's uh, inevitable. And so I've seen fields that have significant club root damage and significant Swede midge damage. And so it's just really disheartening. I, I don't know where we're gonna go with this. And I really worry about the future of our spring canola crop. Okay, so I'm just gonna skip ahead a little cause I'm running out of time, but um, a big, the most exciting thing that's happening I think right now in, in Ontario canola is winter canola. Um, we registered a couple of years ago, a variety, a hybrid called Mercedes, and uh, it's not herbicide tolerant, but uh, a really nice variety. And we're having a lot of success with winter canola production, particularly in the very Southern parts of the province where we can't grow spring canola because it's too hot, but uh, the winter canola is flowering in May. And so the heat isn't as much of an issue. And like, look at these numbers, it's just incredible. We broke, blasted through that hundred bushel barrier um, this year. Um, of course, it, that's just on a small plot in the field, but strong yields nonetheless. And actually those top, the first place winners, um, after harvesting their winter canola, double crop soybeans and pulled off 30 bushels of soybeans. So uh, that's really what's driving this is high yields and, and, and opportunities to double crop in those southern counties. But some spring canola growers in kind of the, the central part of Ontario are also able to grow winter canola and it will not be affected by Swede midge. So I really look forward to seeing some of those uh, growers give winter canola a try. And so I'd love to talk all day about uh, managing this crop, but uh, uh, I, I won't do that. Um, we, we really have to focus on fall management to get the crop in a place where it will overwinter successfully. So we want to plant it a little earlier than we would typically plant our winter wheat. And so that means we are planting it after winter wheat in rotation. Uh, so sometime in early September, depending where you live. Uh, trying to get it to the four or six leaf stage and have some a good root on it so, so it can survive on those root reserves through the winter. And so putting a little fertility down in the fall to get it to that stage. And then making sure we put it on fields with good drainage and low clay content because it, it's not as good at overwintering as, as wheat is. So we need to get it in early and, and pick the right fields. And not seed too thick because um, if you can see on the left here, um, if you seed too thick, the seedlings compete 
And then those crowns are not, are set up above the soil surface. And so they're um, at risk of winter kill. That's the growing point exposed there through the winter. And so we actually want lower seeding rates than we use in spring canola, get those crowns tucked into the soil where they can be protected. And uh, some of the other challenges are slugs. Um, unfortunately, no-till winter canola, I don't think will work in Ontario. Uh, we really need to uh, move that residue or bury that residue uh, to prevent slugs from causing damage in the fall because they'll take the plants as soon as they come out of the ground and cause a lot of damage in a short time. And um, this field in the top uh, was a no-till field and that, where he did have canola, he had 70 plus bushels, but um, we, we have some real challenges with slugs. And so I, I won't go on too much, but um, you know, because of that risk of winter kill, even though the crop looks green in the spring, you kind of have to cut it open and see if the vascular tissue is damaged, especially where those crowns were exposed, this is what you get. And so we check the health of the plant before we put our fertility out. And we do see a bit of heaving too, um, but usually just in patches in the field. And so that's kind of all I have. I just wanted to show a couple pictures of that winning winter canola field this year. Uh, this is on May 1st. So as you can see, it gets going nice and early. And these growers that have never grown canola before are actually using corn planters and air seeders and planting it on 15 inch rows. And it looks awesome. Like it kind of looks like a picket fence. It kind of looks like a corn field and we get these really robust plants and, and winter canola just has huge bud clusters. And so uh, I was pretty much in love with this field and I said I would eat my hat if it didn't go over 80 bushels. I'd never seen such a good uh, field and, and, it, and it was very strong yielding. So. Um, looking forward to seeing what happens with winter canola next year. That's all I got. Thank you so much for your time and for uh, letting me tell you about Ontario. Uh, thanks a lot, Megan. Uh, we actually have a couple questions here before the break. Um, sure. uh, I guess I'll expand this question a little bit, but the question is, can winter canola be grown in Western Canada? And I'll expand it. Uh, maybe describe a little bit about your overwintering temperatures on some of these uh, fields. Right, okay, I'm having trouble opening this up. Um, so over winter in temperatures, we have a whole range of things, right? Um, Cause in the Southern counties, it, it's, I mean, I don't know, Chris, how cold does it get where you live? But it's, I don't think it's so much uh, the temperature. It's able to tolerate our, our minus, you know, 15 and things like that. Snow cover helps, um, but we don't always have snow cover in these areas. So. Um, it's, it's pretty hardy. These new hybrids are quite hardy and, and actually tolerated spring frost this year really well too. So right when they were about to flower. So uh, I don't know uh, the exact temperature, but um, you know, I don't know, would they survive a minus 40 or how, how cold does it get there? But uh, we're having success. So yeah, we've we had not, over, you can't over the years, we've, material, so you might not have success. <laughs> Over the years, we've tried some dormant uh, seeding canola. So you're seeding it like October-ish and then um, with moderate success. Uh, it did it for a couple of years and then uh, it kind of disappeared. So uh, maybe a little bit more research on that. Uh, one last question here just before the break. Um, to ensure lower seeding rate for winter canola, are growers using planters versus air seeders? Yeah, so a lot of our spring canola growers use like a drill and... Um, and that's really hard to get a low seeding rate with the drill. But yes, with a planter, um, we can get, they're, they're really planting like, with a corn planter and these aftermarket discs or plates on the, on the planter, they can go like three pounds. And that's actually, I, I like the look of three pound seeding rate with a corn planter or three and a half. So um, yeah, and air seeders they're using as well. Yeah. One grower has a European high speed drill and he planted at two pounds to the acre and it's a pretty thin stand, but um, I actually think it'll look okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot, Megan. Uh, one comment I had from uh, a researcher here, uh, it says uh, that with, the, with their work, they found winter canola does not have tolerance to the winters in Western Canada. So um, when everybody saw the 100 and over 100 bushels an acre, I think there was lots of excitement that kind of jumped in. So just wanted to kind of bring those forward. So thanks a well, lot, Megan. Uh, I, uh, oh, I, I suggest trying uh, the newest genetics you can get and not seeding it too thick. And uh, But yeah, I think you might be right. It might not be yeah. an opportunity. <laughs> thanks a lot, Megan.